The first meeting focused on the new constitution. The second one uh, focused on the economic options in front of the Hungarian government, particularly on the issue of sovereign debt, on the issue of economic growth, and on, in, on the issue of the relationship with the, between the government and the IMF. The third one, uh, the event today, will uh, mainly uh, discuss the nature of the political system. As you know, the last five, six years of uh, Hungarian politics was rather turbulent. After the sweeping victory of um, Fidesz in uh, 2010, radical institutional changes were implemented and the style of governing also changed very radically. So, so some claim that a uh, non-democratic or at least a hybrid regime was put in place. Others, however, argue that in fact democracy was in crisis well before the change in the government. And in fact, the measures of the current government are exactly aimed at solving this crisis. Some observers see a set of disconnected uh, policies which simply provide a short-term solution to the emerging issues, while others see a systematic drive towards a new political model. So these are big changes and big questions. So we have invited big authorities in the field. The distinguished scholars in the panel are well versed both in democratic theory and regime analysis. Let me introduce them in speaking order. The first one, Andras Bozoki, is professor at the political science department. He also teaches at ELTE and taught at various universities around the world, including Colombia, Nottingham, Tübingen, and Bologna. His main field of research include democratization, political ideas, Central European politics, and the leads. He has published on post-communist transition, comparative democratization, anarchism, transformation of political elites, the European public sphere, and intellectuals in politics. His recent works include Anarchism in Hungary, Theory, History, Legacies, the Roundtable Talks of 1989, the Communist Successful Parties in Central Eastern Europe, and the Intellectuals and Politics in Central Europe. Our second speaker, Andras Lanzi, is Director of the Institute of Political Science at the Corvinus University. His field of research are political philosophy, particularly 20th century political schools and trends, the intellectual history of Hungarian political thinking, modern theories of democracy and epistemological questions of political science. He is the Hungarian editor of the Encyclopedia of Political Thought, the Encyclopedia of Political Science, and the New Handbook of Political Science. He authored numerous books in the field of political philosophy, including Democracy and Political Science, Political Philosophy of the 20th Century, and Utopia as Tradition. The third speaker, Gaspar Miklos Tomás, is a visiting professor at CEU. He used to be the head of the Institute of Philosophy of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and taught at a number of universities, including Oxford, Columbia, Chicago, Georgetown, Yale, and Delta. His works on political philosophy, social theory, and political analysis were collected and published in volumes entitled The Chances of Theory, The Eye and the Hand, Idolatribus, Other World, and The Situation. His essays regularly appear in journals and magazines such as the Times Literary Supplement, The Spectator, Boston Review, and Public Affairs Quarterly, and many others. Now, next to being uh, distinguished uh, academics, the members of the panel are also known to be engaged citizens, opinion leaders, and from time to time, political activists. During the end of the 80s, Professor Bozoki was chief advisor of Fidesz and represented the party at the roundtable negotiations. Around 2003-04, he became the advisor to the Socialist Prime Minister. And from 2005 and to the, uh, to 2006, he was Minister of Culture of Hungary. So he worked closely both with Viktor Orban and Ferenc Jócsa, though not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he tells me. Uh, Professor Lanzi is perhaps most known in the public sphere for the publication of the Conservative Manifesto in 2002. <coughs> He served as advisor of uh, President Shoyo, <coughs> and currently he's the chairman of Sazadweg, a right-wing think tank, which is probably the largest in Hungary. Finally, Professor Tomás was known before 1989 as a leading dissident intellectual. He was an electoral candidate of the opposition already in 1985. In the late 1980s, he was a founding member of the Alliance of Free Democrats. Between 1990 and 1994, he was member of the Hungarian parliament and one of the leaders of his party. In 2002, he became the president of Atak Hungary. Since uh, May 2010, he is the chairman of Green Left. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, okay. 
and uh, you stood again as a candidate of the elections, I, I believe. So, to claim that the panel shows diversity is, as you can see, an understatement. My distinguished colleagues bring very different points of view to the table, and therefore I expect a lively debate. One that contrasts different norms and interpretations, but one that also provides a perspective that appeals to a primarily academic audience. So let me ask Mandrash, uh, you to be the first speaker. Uh, if each of them is, uh, gets about 15 minutes to make their opening statement, then we will have a second round, and then we will open up the discussion to the public. Thank you very much for your kind words, George, and thank you for coming in such a large number. Uh, that is true that I was working at one point uh, with uh, Viktor Orban, something like 20 years ago and something like uh, eight years ago with Ferenc Gyurcs, and probably I'm the only person in this country who worked both of them, but as he correctly said, not at the same time. And uh, at the time when both of them were rising stars in the, in the, on the sky of Hungarian politics. But today I don't want to talk about their personalities and about uh, their psyche, but rather a bit more uh, serious things. I was asked to talk about the system, what sort of system is emerging now in Hungary, what kind of regime can we uh, identify now. Uh, we are uh, talking about a moving target. We try to catch something which is on the rise or on the decline as we as we can judge uh, depending on your on our, uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, the title of my presentation, The Crisis of Democracy uh, uh, in Hungary, uh, refers to uh, the famous Hungarian political thinker István Bibo, uh, who published a, an article with the same title in 1945. And he really felt that Hungarian democracy is in crisis in 1945. That was a very nascent new democracy. Why? Because there was a post-war conditions, you can see. Um, and um, the direction of change was uh, positive. There was a democratization from the Nazi or arrow cross rule uh, towards a, some sort of electoral democracy that we would say today. There were elections, free but not fully fair, because hundreds of thousands were excluded. And the result was the absolute majority of the center-right smallholders party. The government was forced as a grand coalition externally, and opposition was non-existing. And by the way, uh, there was a Soviet occupation in the country. So Soviet op officers intervened Hungarian politics effectively. So if you think of this from this sort of angle, then it is clear that uh, there was not much hope about uh, Hungarian uh, democracy. Um, if we contrast 1945 today, I mean the picture should be much more rosy, uh, although the historical context is something like a post-war context, global economic crisis. Nevertheless, we had free and fair elections in 2010 and absolute electoral victory, majority of the new right Fidesz uh, party, uh, which was translated due to the uh, uh, disproportional uh, nature of the electoral system into a two-third majority in the parliament. Uh, the international context is membership in the European Union, which means that we joined, and that means we share some common democratic valued and values and we signed agreements like that. <coughs> In the meantime, the direction of change is not from dictatorship towards a, some sort of electoral democracy, but a move from a modern liberal democracy to a centralized, illiberal, delegative uh, democracy and even beyond. But uh, if we contrast these two uh, dates, 1945 and 2012, we can see that uh, uh, the conditions today are much more uh, favorable. However, the expectations were growing too, so the notion of democracy has changed as well. Uh, at that time and right after, we had uh, uh, the classic approaches of the minimalist concepts of democracy. What was 
it about. Democracy was seen as a method of selection among competing elite groups. That's the famous uh, Schumpeterian approach. And then later on, Giovanni Sartori, the famous Italian political scientist, said that we should not expect too much from democracy. At least we don't kill each other. Uh, and then later on, Adam Jaworski, the Polish-born American political scientist who studied Chile and Latin American experiences, he said that actually uh, we should stick to the electoral definition of democracy, free elections plus uh, institutionalized uncertainty, and that's it. So these minimalist concepts, uh, when you wanted to code, it was an either-or phenomenon. Either democracy or not. There is no in-between. But as I said, the notion of democracy changed rapidly. And there are a couple of authors here who fundamentally altered our way of thinking about democracy. What democracy is and what democracy is not one was asked by many people, including Philip Schmitter, who is sitting in this room, but also Dahl, Rose, Tilly, Pateman, Habermas, uh, Diamond, Urbinati, Mainwaring, Linz, and Stepan, and a lot of other people. This is not a lecture about democratic theory, so I don't go into detail. The point is that now democracy is not seen as a method of selection, but as a democratic process. Uh, how to behave between two elections, not just the electoral moment, which give mandates to uh, even authoritarian-minded leaders. So mainly seen as a process and uh, it is a more or less thing. It is not an either or thing anymore, but more or less. There is a continuum. And then we can go from full dictatorship to competitive authoritarianism, semi-authoritarian regime, semi-democracy, all sorts of hybrid regimes that you can find in the literature. And then um, semi-democracy, electoral democracy, and liberal democracy. And I should say that uh, modern democracy, unquestionable, unquestionably liberal democracy. So political rights plus civil liberties. It's not only about competition, participation, and the uh, rights and <coughs> civil liberties uh, are inevitably inseparable part of liberal democracy. So uh, let's see how to how to de-democratizing countries. What are the types of de-democratization? Um, and uh, when I say that is a continuum, then uh, we have to keep in mind that not only there is a continuum between dictatorship and democracy, but also within democracy, there are different sorts of democracies, from electoral to delegative, illiberal, semi-democracies, and liberal, full liberal democracies. And, um, and uh, if you see some types of de-democratization based on the literature, breakdown of democracy, that's the classic Linz and Stepan, 1970s, which is about the military takeover, how the military took over in Brazil, in Argentina, Chile, and the like. It, these are well-known stories. In our case, we cannot talk about military uh, coup d'etat or uh, military dictatorship, fortunately. Second case can be rev revolution from above. I mean, the current Hungarian government talk a lot about revolution, but I don't think that this is a real revolution, what is going on. Revolution from above is something like uh, there is a democratically elected leader who rapidly abuses the democratic rules and turns the country into dictatorship, like in Germany in the 1930s. And then we have the case of foreign assistance or foreign occupation. That is like foreign military occupation or foreign assistance, secret services, military advisors lead to the installation of dictatorship. It's like the Munich Pact in 1938, which ended democratic Czechoslovakia 1938, and then World War II, uh, foreign occupation of Netherlands, France, Belgium, Denmark, and so on and so forth, or post-war Eastern Europe under Soviet occupation after 1945. Or maybe you can say the US uh, um, CIA involvement in Chile in uh, 
changing the government and killing Salvador Allende at the time of the military putsch. Uh, that is again not the case. It, it was the case in Eastern Europe after the Second World War, but fortunately we cannot talk about this. The next is unstable democracy destroyed by an authoritarian leader. Uh, this is a sort of preemptive strike, so to say, on a nascent and fragile democracy by a democratically elected leader who is autocratic, autocratic minded and act in the name of democracy. So there are fragile, newborn, unstable democracies. Think about Belarus under Lukashenko. Lukashenko was elected uh, uh, as a result of free election and then he turned after 94 the regime into autocracy. So there is an East European example for that, although there is no example for this within the European Union. Or we can also talk about Ukraine under Kravchuk and Kuchma leading the country from a default half democracy to default democracy to semi-democracy, or Georgia under Gamsabordia, or I would even say Venezuela under Chavez. When Chavez came to power, there was a democratic election, and then he preempted all the democratic institutions. Uh, Russia, that was, it is debatable whether it was ever a democracy, but it was more democratic in the 90s than after the Yeltsin-Putin change. And uh, we have a more recent uh, example um, that we can perhaps discuss. Uh, what about Bosnia-Herzegovina? I mean, was there any democ uh, democracy there? There is a multinational state, ethnic cleansings, post-war situation, and then the European Union uh, puts a guy as a protector. So it's a protectorate since Dayton who controls the political process. Obviously, it is not democracy. It is something uh, which degenerates democracy but maintains peace. And uh, it's too early to say anything about Greece and the caretaker crisis managing uh, government of technocrats. Uh, but it is an interesting, uh, maybe we will have more cases in the future whether international organizations, European Union, impose or pushes certain uh, technocratic governments and trying to solve for a short-term econo short economic crisis. But what I'm basically talking about is the last case tonight, and this is hollowing out the demo stable democracy from inside. So uh, this is the case when a democratically elected leader deconstructs full democracy step by step in the name of democracy. I mean, the leader does not say that he is an autocrat. He is against democracy. He is talking about uh, in the name of democracy because democracy became a very positive word since the 1970s. Even autocrats want to present themselves from Central Asia and many, and many other parts of the world as democrats. So they try to give a new notion, a new meaning to their, uh, to their uh, political move in the name of democracy. Um, I found Argentina under Juan Perón in the late 40s as a similar case. Uh, who Perón was democratically elected and then step by step uh, destroyed democracy in Argentina. That was a strong democracy. It was not just a fragile, unstable <coughs> democracy and that was following out. And the question is whether Hungary is on this way or not whether uh, de-democratization is a curse from the center of the state by the leader of the ruling party. If it is will be the case, then Hungary will be a textbook case that such thing occurs within the European Union. It never happened before, therefore, this is a very interesting case. As a citizen of this country, I am not very happy about this, you can imagine, but as a political scientist, I find this case sort of fascinating. Uh, uh, what about the concrete things? I mean, uh, the rise of the Orban regime was not just coming out of the blue. It is not true that uh, there was everything all right until 2010, and from the spring of 2010, suddenly everything went wrong. 
So what are the reasons behind the establishment of the Orban regime? It is already telling that people are not talking about Orban government, but Orban regime, that this is something specific, something different, something that we have never seen so far. And I, would, uh, found, I found a couple of uh, dimensions. The one is the tradition of compulsory consensus. Uh, there are many positive legacies of 1989, and probably this is not so positive that uh, the Roundtable founding fathers were operating within the full consensus. So that was an uh, important principle that not only freedom and democracy and nonviolence are important, but also consensus. Democracy may, must be based on consensus, and uh, too many two-third laws were accepted, which paralyzed the governments. Governments were elected by the people. They tried to govern, but they could not govern because there were so many uh, rules required a qualified majority, two-third majority, that they could not fundamentally Im implement any major reforms. So it was a, a, a sort of trying to dance in a situation which was impossible. So reforms uh, were not implemented. Uh, both the power holders and the population became frustrated. Second, the practice of informality, that is much more long-term, part-dependent, historical story. Hungary was many times in its history occupied by foreign rule, rulers. We had the Ottoman occupation, the Soviet occupation, we were together with Austria. So uh, what Hungarians learned is the practice of informality. This is not so far from Poland, actually. When Poland did not exist in the 19th century, people had to learn how to operate in their own informal circles. So suddenly there was a discrepancy between the formal rules and the informal practices. And I think the Kadar regime, the Hungarian communist regime, was very clever on operating and basing its sort of legitimacy on this practice of informality, second society, second economy, and the like. And that survived after the regime changed. So, so corruption made the communist regime sweet, but the corruption did not make the new capitalist uh, democracy uh, functioning better. Um, third, the phenomenon of partocracy. Democracy was understood as a multi-party rule. So democracy was simply restricted to the rule of the parties. But democracy must be much more than just a multi-party system. So actually, uh, at the end of the second decade of Hungarian democracy, uh, some sort of cartel democracy emerged, in which the two biggest parties, the Socialist Party and Fidesz, were somehow uh, competing on the surface in, in the television, but on b behind the skins, they were collaborating. So that actually helped uh, corruption, and uh, there was no law, no transparency, no transparent law, or party finance, etc. Next step, democracy of privileges. So there were still many privileged groups, uh, inherited privileges, plus the growing in inequalities. Hungary became an increasingly in an unequal society based on privileges. And finally, we can mention uh, the failure of reforms. I briefly uh, mentioned that, and, and the knockout was the 2008 uh, economic, the outbreak of the economic, global economic and financial crisis, which uh, uh, brought down the Hungarian economy by 6% in one year. And finally, the behavior of the opposition, Fidesz was a, the strongest opposition party, and there was a rise of an intra-party centralization and both democracy in Fidesz, within Fidesz, since 2003, at the time when they modified their party regulation. That gave an unprecedented power to the party president, Viktor Orban, who could control uh, basically every candidate of the party, and he had a personal veto power on deciding who should run in the elections and who should not. So what, is, what was happening within Fidesz, and that is the weakest point of all democracies, the intra-party democracy, that is, which is under the voter, uh, that was simply extrapolated after 2010 for the whole country. 
And also political belonging was identified with belonging to the nation. And that was an unfortunate <coughs> populist discourse who presented uh, Fidesz as, uh, as the real ex uh, exponent of the nation. The nation cannot be in opposition, said Viktor Orban in 2002. That is identifying a political belonging to the belonging of an ethnic community or a political community, which is very dangerous for democracy, in my view. And what about, so that was, all of these things occurred in the last 10 years, and that led to a shaky sort of Weimar type of weak state and still democracy, but uh, increasing distrust towards the office holders. And what are the conceptual underpinning of the Orban regime? The major ideology, if, the, if we can talk about ideology at all in the case of the regime, national unification, nemzet egyesítés, national unification, that's the major goal. The government doesn't talk about people, they, don't, they do talk about the nation. Those who are living inside and outside Hungary, ethnic conception of the nation, which is going hand in hand with the policy of social exclusion and social division within the country. So some sort of anti-social policy together with a unification ideology. Secondly, the central area of power, that was an uh, idea of Viktor Orban that he already presented in 2009, that there should be one major hegemonic party in the center of politics, and some splinter parties on the left and on the right, like in the Horthy era in Hungary, one major party. It's not a multi-party system, it's not a two-party system, but a hegemonic party system, a non-competitive. That was his idea. Uh, number three, the change of the elites. That is very important, that uh, in many times we see that uh, there was a conscious effort to change everywhere in independent and state top positions <coughs> in, uh, by politically committed pro-government people. And uh, some sort of ideology of the elite changes anti-communism, but this is a highly selective anti-communism because if you think about the, the secret agents of the previous regime, then the government doesn't want to uh, make it uh, clear who belonged to those, uh, those ranks and who did not belong to those uh, secret spies. Um, they voted actually against that proposition to make the regimes transparent in that sense. But anti-communism served the cement, the ideological goal, to change the elite positions. And uh, number four, power politics, uh, error politica, that is to believe that, that, that uh, only power counts at the end. And, uh, and not, uh, nothing uh, ideologies, Viktor Orban declared that the end, there is an end of ideology and uh, what matters really is power. So if the European Union shows uh, its muscles, then we are uh, ready to accept that, but as long as they are sort of tolerant towards us, then we can do whatever we prefer. Number five, revolutionary conditions. That, is, uh, that was a very interesting statement right after the revolution, that this was a revolution at the polling stations, polling booth, and uh, therefore uh, it is a justification, it serves as a justification for the suspension of normal democratic process. And there is a speedy, uh, non-transparent non legislation, a sort of de de uh, governing by decrees. This is what Latin, Amer Latin Americans call decretismo, that uh, instead of the parliamentary machinery, they use the shortcuts wherever they can do. And finally, uh, my last two slides, this is the short history of democracy in Hungary. Um, in the first, um, we are talking about 2,000 years, uh, and only the last 20 years we can talk about democracy in the case of Hungary. By all standards, Freedom House, uh, Eurobarometer, uh, Democracy Barometer, all these measuring institutions, Hungary was a liberal democracy and consolidated, even a consolidated 
democracy. But since 2006, uh, we can see uh, increasing signs of deconsolidation. So there is a deconsolidation procedure, moral crisis following the assert speech of the Prime Minister, boycotting the Prime Minister's speeches in the Parliament. The opposition always left the Parliament when the Prime Minister wanted to say something for three years between 2006 and 2009. So the, the boycott politics, which is always goes against consensus building, and then uh, increasing social tensions and the advance of the far right, plus the cartel democracy that I mentioned. 2008 came the economic crisis, weak state, minority government, increasing feeling of Weimarization. And from 2010, Hungary moves uh, from, I mean, those who are supporters of the government claim that we are still within the framework of liberal democracy. We just moved away from consens uh, consociational democracy, consensus-based democracy, to majoritarian democracy. But both forms are pretty well going together with liberal democracy. But the point is that we moved beyond that. The, the question is not that whether we move from consensus building to majoritarian democracy, but beyond that. And I think by today, with lots of decisions that I elaborated in my book in Hungarian and in my article in English, uh, we can find that there is a, a rise of a centralized illiberal democracy. And if it continues this way, it poses a danger of a hybrid regime or potentially a semi-democracy. As you can see, I don't suggest that we are already living in Hungary in an autocracy or dictatorship. Uh, of course, it is extremely difficult to measure this because, as I said at the beginning, this is a moving target. However, uh, uh, democracy is more than just uh, constitutionalism. Even if there was a constitutional coup d'etat, a one-sided constitutional making, and the decline of rule of law, the elimination of checks and balances, and so on and so forth, replacement of top judges, new electoral law, and so on, uh, still we can say that uh, democracy is more than these institutions. It is also about the spirit of people and their activity, their participatory uh, behavior, and the like. So I would conclude that uh, uh, what we have now is still democracy. Maybe some of my colleagues will disagree with me. Uh, Professor Janos Kor Kornai already mentioned that this is autocracy. Uh, difficult to measure, but I think uh, what the major problem is to, to focus on the on the on the biggest uh, thing that in 1989 Hungarians expected not only political democracy but social liberation and economic welfare. And political democracy obviously could not deliver these goods. And now people are frustrated and searching for scapegoats. They expect nothing but jobs, economic survival and punishing the previous elites. So in that sense, uh, the mix which is created by the Orban government fits very well to certain wishes of uh, large segments of the society. I would call the present political regime, I, I don't know what will happen in half year, maybe it will be consolidated or returning to, to something more decent form of democracy as a centralized illiberal democracy or following O'Donnell delegative democracy the dominant discourse is a sort of opportunistic uh, patriarchal nationalism and the social content is a uh, sort of exclusive national bourgeoisie, uh, bourgeois uh, democracy. Thank you very much for your attention. you uh, this afternoon. I really enjoyed uh, Andrash's lecture and um, maybe uh, to the surprise uh, some of you, I, um, I agree uh, 
a number of things uh, what he has said, except his conclusions. <laughs> um, the title of this uh, seminar, or, or, or conference, whatever it is called, is um, a statement, uh, the crisis of Hungarian democracy. Um, I myself uh, produced the piece in the early 1990s, maybe the, using the same title, um, Hungarian Democracy in Crisis, something like that. And later on I uh, realized that uh, a democracy is always in crisis, not only in Hungary, but everywhere. Maybe it is due to the nature of democracy. Because democracy is something, uh, in my understanding, despite the various, uh, or just taking them as a basis of what I want to say, uh, all the possible ideas or uh, theories of, of democracy. Democracy is something, and, and we know it from ancient times, that is uh, the most dubious kind of uh, form of government. It is always um, uh, penchant for um, popular um, dissatisfaction, popular um, uh, pressure, on the government, and so on and so forth. There were a little populism is always there in a democracy. But I don't want to go on along the line of uh, telling my own views uh, on uh, different uh, theories of democracy. Let me jump into the middle. I think that what is in crisis next to democracy, which is, like I said, is almost a natural thing, uh, what is really in crisis in Hungary is liberalism. Let me uh, tell you uh, my very brief uh, story of the past uh, 20, 22 years of Hungarian history. The first thing is, it is called post-communism. Post-communism uh, belongs to the history of communism and not to the history of something else. Post-communism, in my understanding, is now the condition of the whole world. All countries, the whole mankind is uh, in a state of, uh, in a post-communist uh, condition. By which I mean that communism failed, but in various ways it has survived. It has survived at least a grand idea. I have participated in the past 20 years in several discussions where um, my um, leftist partners uh, kept telling about uh, ideas like egalitarianism, tolerance, whatever. And I, I, um, I, I, I came to understand them as that they are um, deploring the fall of uh, socialism. But in uh, 1989, communism failed in Eastern Europe. And the Hungarian case is uh, something um, peculiar. This was one of the most uh, progressive, so to say, among the socialist countries. Soft uh, dictatorship, uh, as uh, many people tend to describe the, Kardarian, uh, the Kardas regime. Then we realized and, and started to do something else uh, together with other post-communist countries in its narrower meaning of post-communism in East, uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe in general. And the major uh, idea was uh, liberalization. Liberalization of the economy, liberalization of the society, and liberalization uh, of the culture. This was the program of a country coming out of the communist, uh, from under the communist regime. And it hold out the, uh, held out the, the, the promise that uh, the economic, the social, and the cultural promises um, will be um, fulfilled. Liberalism, with it, whatever the meaning it has, I don't want to go into that. Uh, liberalism happened to um, 
decentralize the economy, privatization, and uh, introducing the market element. Yes, it is unprecedented in history that a completely, almost completely state-owned economy, it was turned into a uh, private uh, ownership economy within some 15 years or so. <laughs> a number of um, under-surface moral problems piled up just because of, uh, of, of privatization. But privatization as such is still an unknown story in this country. Only the moral consequences in various ways. Uh, it, 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 it is uh, observable. But this is just one thing among many other things uh, by which Hungarian economy has been liberalized. <coughs> Social field. Egalitarian society is something that we don't really want. We need, we need uh, free freedom of, of uh, enterprising and so on and so forth gaps between uh, salaries, all that kind of things. Yes, this tendency started already under the Kardar regime. We have uh, statistics that the gap between the lowest incomes and the highest incomes tended uh, to, um, to widen during the Kardar regime. From two or, uh, two or three, uh, already in the late 80s, it was four and a half, four, uh, 4 point five percent, I mean the difference, the gap between the lowest and the highest incomes, and now it is about uh, seven, or, 7 or 8 percent, something like that. I think it is still rather an egalitarian society. The upper 10 percent is 7.5 uh, times richer than the lowest 10 percent. That's it. <laughs> Sorry if it wasn't clear. It is still not a wide gap if you, can, uh, if you compare it to other uh, countries. Now, um, in the culture field, I don't want to go into it because I have very short time and I, I, uh, I, I probably have to uh, cut it very short. But the outcome of this uh, program of liberalization including political rights, liberty, and sense of constitutionalism, all that stuff. The final outcome is indicated, uh, for example, uh, I mean the consequences um, by, the, uh, by the Pew research uh, data, set of data. It is interesting that it is the American Pew research that, uh, that has already measured the post-communist countries in 1991 and they uh, repeated their uh, uh, measuring these countries in 2009. Hungary is an exceptional case among, especially in the East Central European countries. Just uh, uh, a few things. Approval of change to democracy. The change in Hungary is minus 18. It is by far the highest comparing to the neighboring countries. Czech, Czech Republic, it's zero. <laughs> Slovakia, plus one. Poland, plus four. Hungary is minus 18. Uh, Ukraine, minus 42. Uh, <laughs> Approval of change to capitalism. Hungary uh, has the, the lowest uh, figure here. I mean, the worst, if you prefer. Hungary is in minus 34% comparing the approval of change to capitalism in 1991 and 2009. Just uh, in Czech Republic, minus 8. Poland, minus 9. Slovakia, minus 3. Shall I go on? Hungary, just let me repeat, 34. Uh, may I go on with this? I don't want to bore you. But uh, the problem, uh, it, 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 it was obvious by 2010 that there is something completely wrong in Hungary. A number of things must have a gun array. What? <coughs> this question is still there. Andres was trying to figure out what the factors could be. 
accept his conclusion that, it is, that the democracy is in crisis. This is what I don't share. What has come to uh, an end, probably, is uh, the regimes, or the regime, during these uh, past 20 years, when uh, the major policy was characterized by liberalization. Most Hungarians said no to this problem. The global crisis in 2008 was not the first economic crisis of Hungary. Hungary had already been in economic crisis in 2008. And Hungary was just as indebted, today is just as indebted a country as it was 22 years ago. You have to explain this. You have to do something with it. And uh, Now, in 2010, yes, there is a two-third majority government in the parliament supported by two-third majority. And it was declared, yes, uh, that a, uh, uh, a revolutionary politics uh, uh, was to come. Um, Andres has used the word revolution in a sense that I wouldn't use. Revolution simply means radical changes. Not something completely reversal what what was uh, what had been uh, before, and um, yes, there are radical changes in Hungary going on. Maybe it is about to come to an end, uh, which was uh, almost declared or is being declared by the prime minister of this country. He promised to uh, he promised to uh, reconstruct the country, and you may ask the question why. Partly the reason for the failure of the past 20 years after the uh, uh, regime change. You may disagree, anybody may disagree with, with the means and instruments, uh, policies he applies. But you have to understand that so many, the reforms during the, the previous years uh, failed just because the incompetence of the governments, because they lacked the necessary uh, speed, I would say. And yes, if you start, this is the point of debate, I understand, clearly understand. Once you start negotiating every bit of a, of a reform or, or a bill uh, suggestion, then you will not be able to do anything. I think this is what drives the Prime Minister. You may challenge it. It is against democracy. I don't think so. He is the man of democracy. And once uh, Andras uh, is here again, uh, let me uh, mention his name and this, let me give it to you because you are also praised by the author, Edith Alta, who, who produced a book on uh, Fides uh, in English. This book is available from now on. By the way, the first and maybe the, the only book in English uh, on Fides forever. And, uh, and, the, um, and why I'm just uh, mentioning this is uh, Mr. Orban was one of the founding fathers of this uh, new democracy. I don't think, and I can't see any uh, proof or evidence that he would like to, uh, to change this democracy into something else. What he wants, what he wants is uh, not to mistake liberalism for licentious social life and economic life. Yes, he declared that we, uh, this country needs something like national interest, a phrase that has not ever been mentioned by, this, uh, by the leftist in this country. And yes, he would like to shatter the networks behind economic processes, social processes that, according 
to his understanding of the situation hindered to change this country into a real democracy, a real uh, democratic <coughs> regime. And finally, because I know I'm beyond my time limit, uh, why I, I have a doubt that uh, Hungarian democracy is in crisis is simply because despite the, uh, the scholarly efforts, even I think Andras has also uh, mistaken uh, democracy for liberalism. I don't know whether in any, any, world, any, any country of the world, if there is a right-wing government on top, why, why do you think that you should uh, demand leftist policies on the right-wing government? I think it is a, 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 a flawed argument, and this is the source of the problem, whether Democracy is in crisis in Hungary, or maybe something else is in crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, uh, the fact that somebody is being a founding father of liberal democracy in this country doesn't prove anything. As both Mr. Orban and myself have been founding fathers of liberal democracy and we both have betrayed it. And um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't have anything to reproach him. But from a moral point of view, we are both traitors, that's it. And uh, in the opposite direction, but um, as it happens. But, Quite apart from the peculiarities and peccadilloes and uh, colourful uh, historical elements of the Hungarian changes, which uh, would be anyway very very difficult to describe to a bunch of foreigners that you are, um, uh, is um, so I would <laughs> I would rather uh, uh, draw your attention to a few elements in the doubtlessly novel. Uh, character of the present Hungarian polity that that may be well, if I'm right, which is not sure, uh, maybe instructive um, as a sultry warning uh, for others because I uh, I am one of the great admirers of the present Hungarian prime minister and I think that he shows the way uh, to others, uh, not in the direction I very much like. Nevertheless. He is, and his party, and, 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 and the great mass of people that support him <coughs> are showing uh, some uh, things that are very interesting in the present juncture of uh, development of uh, late capitalism. Very late capitalism. <laughs> and, um, <coughs> well, because we are not living in a post-communist but in a pre-communist era, we don't. And, uh, and uh, so, what, so what, I, what, I, what I mean here is the following. The development, the development of uh, technology, the demographic changes, the inception of a cognitive economy, the uh, elements of digitalization and uh, such like that have changed the character of capitalism in the last uh, two or three decades have introduced an element which determines the biopolitical term in uh, the contemporary political conflicts. The problem is, as I see it, is that the ratio of people who in the sense of a old-fashioned understanding of Marxist capital are producers of value, of exchange value, people who are producing commodities for the market in the old way as it has been conceived in industrial societies of old, still exist, still have a very great importance, but they are a minority. Uh, uh, and that's one thing. 
Second, I have to be very sketchy. Second, capitalism seems to have survived the death of what has been regarded as the essence of capitalism, namely the conflict between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. There is no proletariat in the old sense, and there is no bourgeoisie in the old sense either. The determinant classes of classical capitalism in a cultural, political, and social sense do not exist anymore or are not determinant factors in the contemporary political life, although still important segments in every society. Now, as um, a small fraction of <coughs> those people who are alive and active today are quite sufficient to produce all the goods and services and symbolic goods necessary for the market. Um, and the rest are not and cannot and do not participate in this process. And because there is no uh, social segment that would keep people alive who are not participating in the value-creating, commodity-producing pro uh, uh, project. The problem is facing all contemporary societies that the non-producing strata of population that taken together are a, ma are a majority now. How will they survive in the conditions in which governments and states are economically weaker in which redistribution systems are radically weakened, in which the socialization model that used to be labor and the character, a very strong institutional character of classical capitalism, in which people lived in institutions, family, church, union, mass party, club, the local pub, uh, the uh, sports club, the uh, 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 neighborhood, etc., 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 all disintegrating. So the decay of the institution, strong and dense institutional character of old capitalism, disintegrating. Class identity is disintegrating. Uh, states disintegrating in their old uh, model. I'm, I'm, I'm quoting now uh, Mr. Orban, who is very um, adamant in in his, uh, in underlining that not that he would put an end to liberalism, he never mentions that, but he would certainly say that he's putting an end to the welfare state, which doesn't happen to exist. But never mind. <laughs> it's even easier to put an end to it. If it doesn't. <laughs> and um, and. Um, but he's right, that's a closed chapter. And um, so, the states today, when the redistribution institutions of the state and the social, societal, political, etc., et underpinnings of classical capitalism doesn't, don't function as they did before, uh, and where still there is no other legitimate income and source of a dignified and legitimate existence exists apart from labor and capital. But labor and capital both are a diminishing segment of society. Most people, and an increasing number of people, do live outside it. And Although, of course, the, at the same time, the market system, of course, is colonizing other life systems as well, so it's a complicated process, of course. So it is incumbent upon government uh, to provide for some who can't live otherwise, who can be kept alive only through redistribution and through government handouts, and the states have less and less income and resources to provide for that. So states will have to decide who to keep alive and who not to keep alive. Politics is re-becoming a question of life and death. 
And the problem in this loosely democratic or liberal or whatever constitutional regimes we live in, less and less so everywhere, um, the question is, how can we legitimize the denial of livelihood to some people? How do you legitimize that? How do you integrate society in which some people are condemned to marginalization, to decay, to uh, 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 déclassement, to, to a very short and very fast way downwards? How do you legitimize that? Because you don't stop it. There's no present day policy that took it upon itself to say, we'll stop this and we'll go up. No, it is accepted. Uh, that's very interesting. It's a very interesting uh, <coughs> consequence of the crisis. Not a real revolutionary mood. On the contrary, on the contrary, a tragic mood in which the consequences are reluctantly accepted, although morally condemned. And so, how do you how do you legitimize this? How do you reintegrate society? As well, uh, there are various ways. One way is chosen by many conservative governments, by no means uniquely the Hungarian one, a remoralizing of politics, you should say, that the serving poor will be provided for lightly, the underserving poor, the immoral people, the useless ones, the welfare queens, the social schmarotta, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, you know, the people who don't work hard, don't pay taxes, live on the welfare systems, the sponges, and so on. Those who won't be kept alive. Those who won't be kept alive. They are bad. And they don't deserve the bounty of society. To this, of course, is added everywhere again, um, the um, are added the populations that are somehow regarded and branded as alien. Mm -hmm. Immigrants in many Western societies, the Roma in Eastern Europe, and other similar groups everywhere. And the uh, racial, uh, sexual, denominational, uh, cultural and other discriminations are synthesized with the moral <laughs> condemnation of those of those condemned. Uh, so not only are uh, some groups of a darker hue, but also they seem to be characteristically deficient in morality. Uh, you know, asylum seekers and uh, other dubious elements, uh, immigrants, migrants, intellectuals, <laughs> um, you know, uh, bohemians, artists, useless people, are uh, shown in their true colors as not being part, as indeed they are not, part of the mainstream, of the disciplined, of the uh, different, of the humble, of the diligent, of the well-adjusted, well-integrated group that wants to keep them out. Now, this is what is happening in Hungary. It is not different to, it is not different from France or from Kosovo, because everywhere the same thing is happening. But the specific density of such measures, the open advocacy of uh, marginalization of groups, cultures, political cultures, deemed in some vague way as to be unproductive, non-national, my favorite expression, and I am convinced yours, is uh, and those foreign among you will enjoy that, the foreign hearted, <laughs> of which species I'm, I'm a dignified representative. 
<laughs> and, um, well, I, I'm told, usually, in the writing press that I'm foreign-hearted. I didn't know that, but, uh, but now I know. And um, so, uh, so the density of measures, the determination of the new political class to create an institutional framework in which discipline can be imposed, in which order can be kept, in which demands can be uh, kept at a minimum, in which uh, it is sure that rebellious behavior uh, is held in contempt and then possibly punished. Uh, this is mostly symbolic, of course, not many people are punished, actually. And this, of course, creates a situation in which people find the explanation of their dissatisfaction, unhappiness, alienation, and such like in the immoral behavior of groups designated as immoral. So a great fight indeed is taking place, as, uh, and, and of course the target is moving, and, uh, and you know, sometimes, sometimes it is the selfish, greedy, and short-sighted behavior of liberal market fanatics. Sometimes it's the laziness and irresponsibility of welfare state uh, lazy bombs. Um, sometimes is the utopian uh, convictions and uh, distance from reality of leftists. Sometimes the uh, lack of realism of those who, re who, who want equality in a society in which uh, competition and excellence will drive things forward. Ideologically, it is very colored, very diverse, very vague, very changeant, uh, in, you, know, you know, the color. And, uh, and, and, uh, but the essence, the essence is, of course, like always, in all societies in which minorities, ruling classes and such, rule, how to get the support of those disadvantaged by the regime to sustain the regime. That's the problem of all class societies, and it is brilliantly solved by the present dispensation from Monsieur Sarkozy, one of my favorites, and uh, to uh, Mr. Cameron, and to Boyko Borisov, what have you. And uh, uh, now uh, Monsieur Sarkozy uh, has started his re-election campaign with a proposal of organizing a referendum about what, guess, how to retrench and to limit the rights of the unemployed and of the immigrants. And, uh, right, uh, he may be late. But, uh, but, but most certainly this shows the rhetoric and the political toolkit these people are using and which is influencing also, it's the last one, influencing also the adversaries of these regimes who are trying desperately, this is why the opposition for example in this country is so unsuccessful, so hopeless. They want to prove that they are meritorious. They are virtuous. They are as good patriots as the rest. Uh, that they, uh, they're far from being egalitarians, offering uh, goodies to undeserving, lazy, um, untalented people. Um, I just heard the uh, leader of the uh, Hungarian Socialist Party, leader of the left, right? Uh, who said, yes, yes, when the state is disbursing resources to uh, the needy, it has the right to expect something in return. You know that. What, what do you accept? I.e., they have to be integrated, and if they are not integrated, they won't be integrated. <laughs> right. And, of course, so, so, so the people who who are pinning their hopes on this kind of opposition will be uh, bitterly disabused 
because uh, the opposition to these regimes are deeply poisoned as well by the biopolitical and the moralizing rhetoric and dynamic of the present day systems, which are very adroit, very intelligent in imposing non-existent social models, such as work, which is not available, <laughs> um, uh, diligence and family values 50 years ago discarded by the whole of society. <laughs> um, and so there's, but exploiting very adroitly our great nostalgia, our great nostalgia for an orderly, secure, more egalitarian, nicer, don't despise that, nicer, uh, friendlier society in which human dignity is recognized. What would the plebeian of today, the petty bourgeois of today, if you wish, the middle class person of today, in great danger of losing, well, they have lost their privileges, but now losing their livelihood, their comfort, they create your comforts, their car, their house, their holiday. Uh, they know they're losing. But they see that at least we are honest, hardworking, respectable, cultured people. At least we have to be saved. Not those yahoos, but those are alcoholics. Those are drugged people, those are dirty, and who speak a very, in a very impolite manner. At least let's save civilization. And we are it. And in this nostalgia of security, the elements of selfishness and of exclusion, but also a sense of decency, a desire for acceptable a uh, peaceful, orderly way of life, and which, of course, you leftists disparage. You always want us to persuade, to engage in adventures. Well, I can't finish, but I will interrupt myself. Thank you. <laughs>